Hello folks. Today, we're taking a look at a system that, as we'll soon see, might be the perfect answer to your home lab needs. It's powerful but power efficient and has some really great features and upgrade potential in a tiny form factor. And here it is. It's this little computer from HP and it's one of the best low power systems that you can buy right now for your home lab. We're going to take a close look into the hardware as well as setting up Proxmox to do some virtualization and run a Minecraft server. This is the HP ProDesk 400 G3 Mini that I picked up on eBay for less than 80 US dollars. And before you run to the comments to correct me on the price, just remember I don't live in the US and I don't buy things in US dollars. Anyway, why do these systems exist and who buys them new? Well, they're for businesses, really big businesses, who need a whole load of computers that perform well but consume very little power and don't take up much space. They're basically thin clients, but aren't terrible and underpowered because they don't need a virtualized environment on the network to do any actual serious computing tasks. We're not talking about a system this size with an integrated Celeron or Pentium, no, this has an entire Intel desktop processor in a one liter form factor. These systems keep the power bills down while still providing decent performance for everyday tasks and even though the target audience is very clearly businesses, it doesn't mean they can't be a great addition to your home lab. You can use them as something like a media server, virtualization node, or they can even fill more important roles within your home network as something like a router, firewall, and DNS server all in one. The whole system draws as little as eight watts of power at idle, meaning for at least the power consumption, it's comparable to Raspberry Pis and other single board computers. I do have an older Pi 2B somewhere that I used for quite a few years, but I don't know where it is, so you'll just have to imagine that I've got it here. I've used a variety of Pis over the last few years, and like the 2B, they all typically consume around 2 to 3 watts of power at idle, so the increase of 5 watts for the HP system is pretty much nothing. That is basically as much as charging a phone. In terms of power bills, it would cost me around 9 or 10 dollars to run this system 24-7 for an entire year, or basically the price of 2 McChickens. That's pretty much nothing, and is surprisingly quite a bit less than the router provided by my ISP. Coming back to single board computers, I really do like Raspberry Pis, but I haven't had much interest in them recently because I've found them to be a bit limited, especially in terms of features and expandability. Don't get me wrong, I spent many years using my Pi 2B for retro gaming and web server stuff, and it was great, but it really wasn't perfect. They definitely have their uses for some people, but they're just not cheap anymore like they used to be. I remember when they were meant to be around $30, and now you'd be hard pressed to get a Pi 5 for less than $90, at least where I live. It gets worse though, because the problem with buying Pis on their own is that they don't include a power supply, case, or any cooling at all, so many people go for a bundle, which of course costs more. Starter kits that include all the necessary components are cool and very useful, but you do still need add-on boards or Pi hats to get support for features like M.2 storage. That's why I found myself really liking this mini PC, because having an Intel processor with M.2 and upgradable memory in a compact size is really useful and is actually really affordable too. While it is substantially larger than a Raspberry Pi, I think the features and performance make up for the size. So what hardware did I get? While there are many different configurations for these HP systems, this ProDesk 400 G3 has an Intel Kaby Lake i3-7100T dual-core processor. It's not a particularly powerful processor, which is something I think is important to keep in mind. If you want more cores, you'll end up spending a bit more, but older generations of these systems can often be quite a bit cheaper. While it definitely isn't difficult to get a more powerful computer for the same price, if you want something that's compact and actually power efficient than this, so far seems to be a really good way to go. The third generation of these HP systems support both 6th and 7th gen processors, but we are limited to the 35 watt versions in the ProDesk 400. There's a 65 watt version of the Elite Desk which supports up to the Intel Core i7-7700, but the immediate question is, well how do they cool it? For starters, the CPU cooler in the 65 watt model is copper instead of aluminium, which is great, but they also just stamped a bunch of holes in the top panel because that's where the laptop style blower fan draws in the air. Too bad they didn't do that for all the other models. The processor we got with this system is an odd one because while it does have hyper threading, it doesn't support or even actually need turbo boost. 
To keep the TDP at only 35 watts, the more powerful processors like the i5s and i7s have reduced base clocks, but then used turbo boosts to bring the speeds up and, as a consequence, the power draw is increased too, but only for short time periods. The i3-7100T doesn't need to do that though, because it only has two cores and can run at 3.4GHz all the time. It also doesn't produce much heat for that extra speed. My ProDesk 400 came with 4GB of DDR4 SODIMM memory, which I know isn't much, but it doesn't really matter for my needs. The included module is rated for up to 2666MHz, which this processor isn't compatible with. Like the majority of the non-HEDT KB Lake processors, the 7100T's memory support maxes out at 2400 MHz, so the included memory stick will just run a bit slower than it's meant to. The system's support maxes out at 32GB using two 16GB modules, although that does go up to 64GB in the newer generations. This system didn't come with any storage or a Wi-Fi card because I asked the eBay seller if they would remove both before sending it to me, and they offered me a reduced price for that. It's always worth asking for something like that because I'd rather not pay for features and hardware I'm not going to use. The Wi-Fi antennas are still installed in this system, so I could get a Wi-Fi card later on if I want. I also have plenty of storage that is faster and way more reliable than a functionally useless SATA laptop hard drive, even something as cheap as a WD Green SSD would do. I understand the need for the hard drive so a copy of Windows can come pre-installed for the average user, but I'd really rather not contribute to e-waste any more than I already do with all this stuff. One really important thing to keep in mind when buying these systems on eBay though, is that many of them are sold as bare bones, which means they don't include processors or memory, and often don't include the proprietary and mandatory power brick either. I'd personally steer clear of those kinds of listings because it tends to mean that the eBay seller has taken all the good parts to resell them. That kind of system could be good if you already have a processor and memory, but it can also affect your ability to get a refund if the system is faulty, and then the seller decides to be less than honest about whose problem it is. Moving on, it's time to take a look at the design and the hardware features. I really like the styling of this generation of HP mini PCs because they come in this good looking little chassis that I think contrasts the angled vents on the front with the silver accent for the ports quite well. Compared to the other options from around the same time, I think the HP systems look the best, mostly because the Think Centers use cheap feeling shiny plastic, although the Optiplexes are a bit better, I still think they look quite dated too. You might not agree with me on that, but I do think the latest models from all three companies are a big step up, it's just that the HP's looked better for longer. The build quality is really nice too, the entire chassis and top panel of the ProDesk are made from metal with a very nice black paint finish. Even the front panel feels nice, although it is still clearly painted plastic. One downside for these is that the vents on the front here are mostly fake, with tiny slits in some of them to actually let air through. I don't know how much actual vents would do, because the fan doesn't really draw air from the front of the system anyway. Speaking of the fan though, it was quite loud at 50% speed, but kept the processor at reasonable temperatures under a 100% load. Next up is the ports and the hardware. On the front of the system, we've got two USB 3.1 ports, as well as the typical 3.5mm audio jacks. There's one thing missing that the higher end models get, and that's the USB-C port. But, as someone who doesn't really use USB-C, I'm not personally bothered by the lack of it. Moving to the rear of the system, we get a single DisplayPort connector, as well as a serial connector, Flex I.O. expansion with a VGA port, two more USB 3 ports, two USB 2 ports, a single Gigabit Ethernet NIC, and a barrel power jack. There is some variation in the ports you get on the different models, but even here on the ProDesk 400, it's an alright selection for most uses. The serial port is normally replaced with DisplayPort or HDMI on the higher end systems though, and with the integrated HD630 GPU, you can run three monitors at once. The major feature we really don't get on this ProDesk 400 is Intel vPro, which isn't a big deal for me, but if you do want it, you'll need a compatible system and processor. The easiest way to tell if your system has vPro is that the Intel sticker will say vPro on it, provided the sticker is original of course. vPro gives you access to remote management features that allow you to control and configure the system over the network, similar to IPMI on a server motherboard. 
I don't personally think vPro is as good as IPMI in most cases, and it can be a serious security risk on some incorrectly configured systems with outdated firmware. I don't personally use it on any of my systems because I really don't have much hardware to manage at the moment, but like most of the things I don't use, it might actually be really useful for you. Now we're going to take a look at the internals. To open the system up, we just undo the single thumb screw on the rear and slide the top cover off. The thumb screw is retained in the back of the system, which is really great because it means I can't lose it. Inside we find what is basically a laptop fan, along with this tiny heatsink that exhausts hot air out the back. Underneath the fan we find two SODIMM memory slots, only one of which is populated at the moment, but the 7100T does support dual channel memory for extra bandwidth. The memory in this system is just regular SODIMM laptop memory, and while it is good being able to upgrade it, the board doesn't support ECC. There is space for a 2.5 inch hard drive or SSD on the left side of the system, connected with a flexible ribbon cable that combines SATA power and data into a single connector. The hard drive tray and all four screws to mount a drive are included with my system, but that isn't going to be the case for all of the systems listed on eBay. The big problem is that many of these, especially the newer ones, were optioned to only have an M.2 drive and won't have the metal tray, screws, or even the SATA cable. We get a single HP FlexIO V1 expansion bay in the rear of the system, which has a card installed that gives us a VGA connector for whatever reason you'd need or want that. The expansion bay does allow us to install one of a variety of small modules that add extra ports, but there isn't much available for it. I did a bit of looking, and all I could really find was USB and video connectors, as well as a serial port for the higher end models that don't already have it. There's a much better range of cards for the two newer versions of Flex.io, since they've released 2.5 and 10 gigabit Ethernet options, as well as Thunderbolt and a gigabit fiber module, as well as of course extra USB and video connectors as mentioned before. By removing the VGA card that I already have, we've got this open space to put things in, and I do actually have a much better and cheaper option that I'm going to be taking a look at in the near future. There's definitely room for some pretty good hardware upgrades in this system, even though there isn't that much space for storage. The storage is a big trade-off when you go with the system this small, but if you actually need full-sized hard drives, this isn't really the system to go with. The SATA connector is only wired for 5 volts, which is required by laptop hard drives, and doesn't actually have the 12 volts required for desktop hard drives, if you could even fit one in. I'm going to be using a 256GB M.2 SSD from an old laptop. The drive saw around 2 to 3,000 hours of use, but barely any significant writes at all, and should have a lot of life left in it. Keep in mind that this system does only support M.2 NVMe, as in PCIe, and not M.2 SATA drives, which are slower, but often significantly cheaper. HP didn't wire the connector up for SATA, since they probably didn't expect anyone to want to use it for that. The drive I did select gave a perfect result from a smart test without any bad sectors, and barely any terabytes written. I've also removed the cooler to replace the thermal paste, because I don't know how old it is, but it does seem like the seller had already replaced it. It would have worked fine, even though they did make a small mess of it by using way too much. I have a bit of this Deepcool Z5 left over from another video, so I'll just put a little blob in the middle of the heat spreader and reinstall the heatsink. The air guide goes in behind it, and then the fan slides back into place in front of it. Now, let's take a look at the kinds of things we can do with a system like this. My first thought was that maybe we could install TrueNAS, but that wouldn't really be practical because there's only one SATA drive connection. There are newer models that have dual M.2 slots for SSDs, and they would probably make great all-flash servers, but this one is a bit too old for that. There are a few ways to get around the storage limitation, but they are all a bit janky and involve M.2 cards with either SATA or SAS connectors, and an external power supply. It is completely possible to add external drives to these mini PCs, and might even work quite well, but really, why? I personally think it would be better if you need a storage server to just get the larger, small form factor models that have actual hard drive bays and low profile PCIe slots. You can easily set up two mirrored drives in those, which is pretty much the bare minimum for a NAS, and with those PCIe slots you could also install a graphics card for video encoding. 
Unfortunately, the ProDesk Mini doesn't really have any of those options at all, but it can do plenty of other things, so let's take a look. Figuring out what to do with it was just a little bit more difficult than it should have been because I normally only use TrueNAS as a file server and haven't put much thought into anything else. The answer turned out to be virtualization, although this won't be a tutorial, but I thought it was quite interesting to figure out how it all works. I started by installing Proxmox on the system so we can virtualize Debian Linux and run a basic Minecraft server. The main reason I actually chose Debian is because it's the distro I'm most familiar with mostly because of the Raspberry Pi's custom version called Raspbian, but I really don't want to get into Linux distros in this video because that tends to anger some people. Debian is great for a server because the installer includes an option to just not install a desktop environment at all, meaning we can use remote access to control it via the terminal and the GUI won't take up all the system resources. With Proxmox installed, I went to the web interface, uploaded the ISO file, went through the setup and configuration for the VM, and booted it. Once we got into the VM, I downloaded the packages for the Minecraft Spigot server, which is way better optimized than the vanilla server, but pretty much keeps the normal gameplay that we all know and love. I know everyone has their own preferences for Minecraft servers, but the biggest problem I've had with the vanilla version is its performance, even on systems that really should be able to handle it. And here it is, we're in the game and it seems to be running decently without any lag, although the server had all of the available memory assigned to it. An extra 4GB really doesn't cost very much, and more memory would probably help with lag from having extra players, although we still do only have two cores here. With only two cores, we wouldn't really want to run anything else at the same time, but it can at least handle a single Minecraft server pretty well. There's definitely more advanced things we can do, like port forwarding so people outside of your home network can play the game as well, or we could have installed mods or plugins. I don't plan on running a Minecraft server regularly because I don't really play it anymore, but it was interesting to figure out how Proxmox works and see what we can do with it. There's also plenty more you can do with Proxmox, it's not just limited to Minecraft. As it currently is, I don't think this system would be able to run more than one or two VMs like this at once, but we do have plenty of storage left, so we can have others that don't have to run all the time. We definitely don't have the crazy core counts that you can get with platforms like x99 in a more desktop-oriented form factor, but that's why mini PCs like this have become very popular for clustered Proxmox and other virtualization setups. My fairly limited understanding of it is that you have a controller along with multiple worker nodes that actually run the services and VMs. What that means is that if one node fails, the services are easily moved to and run on a different one, and then the failed node can be fixed. That gives better availability of services and reliability of the cluster overall, and with systems like this, the power consumption is still kept at a minimum. That's really why these systems are so great for home labs, because they keep power consumption as low as it can be, so your power bill doesn't look like the entire US defense budget, even with multiple systems running at once. You get great performance for running software and services without breaking the bank, and it's super easy to get virtualization set up and running, even if you've never done it before, and before this video I hadn't. The Minecraft server is all we're going to be taking a look at in terms of virtualization today, although I have a couple of other very interesting things planned for this system in the future. So you don't miss out on the great videos I've got coming, make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications with the bell icon. Also, if you'd like me to take a look at other models of mini PC in the future, let me know which ones in the comments. Thanks for watching, I'll see you all next time.